Javit squad, today we're starting off straight away, there's no time to spray. It's an X Division match. I didn't even have time to write a funny intro for this one, it just goes straight from the beginning. Okay, to be fair, some of you pretty much hate it when I do a long intro, so you'll view that as a good thing. It's Kid Cash and Tony Marmaluke just shoved in the ring. Cash springs off the ropes to get a two count, and then there are many more pin attempts. Cash decides to take the fight to the outside, and Tony the timekeeper seems to be loving life. The two small X Division men decide to start battering each other. It looks like two Yorkshire Terriers go into a fight in a dog park. Kid Cash hits a pump handle into Bat Breaker, but the match continues. Tony fights Bat by hitting a baseball slide. He's a surprisingly grounded wrestler, isn't he? Then out of nowhere, Cash springs off the ropes to hit a moonsault. The commentary team are massively talking up how good Kid Cash is, so if he loses here, he's gonna look an idiot. Cash springs off the ropes again to hit a beautiful cross body for a two count. The match continues as Tony hits a high ankle backdrop suplex. They get back onto their feet after the double down and Cash hits a fisherman style backbreaker that looks like a match ender, but somehow it's just a two. Cash then beautifully rolls through on a pinning attempt to hit the money maker, or the ladies ass as it's known in God's County, and the match is done. All's going well so far tonight. They've got these new match graphics which are cool, but they keep cutting Scott Hall off before he can throw his toothpick. Poor Elvis. Speaking of Elvis, he's been interviewed by Mike Tanay next. He said he likes TNA because they're going against the WWE and they're too stupid to quit. Tanay also asks Hall how he feels about never winning the world title in wrestling, but he dodges the question. I think he was a bit upset about it personally. Truth, the NWA heavyweight champion is up next to defend his title against Scott Hall, but he starts rapping over his entrance music. The problem with Truth's raps are that he has a decent flow, but he doesn't have anything interesting to say. The crowd chant you suck at him, so he tells them if I suck, you swallow. He's taken on Elvis, who seems to have gone from barely existing on this show to being all over it. Hall has a lot of fun messing with Truth in the early gun. Truth fights back by hitting the splits into the kicks. Truth then starts thrusting with happiness and power slams Elvis. The one the Truth keeps dominating as he gets another two count on a scissors kick. The Truth isn't done yet though, not by a long shot, as he hits a leg drop from the top. He gets another two and it might have been better off if he wasn't messing around so much, it could have been better. Elvis then tries to fight back, but the Truth hits a downward spiral for yet another two count. Good match this one. Truth tries another kick, but this time Elvis dodges and nails a choke slam for the double down. Hall follows it with a fall away slam and then he stacks him on the top rope. Hall quickly hits off a back body drop suplex from the top, but a stupid white hoodie man then appears in the ring. Scott Hall's completely distracted by this man, and he's trying to unmask him. Just as that's happening, the Truth wakes up and hits a front suplex, and the match is done. The Truth needs help in every single match. He's been pretty weak champion so far, unfortunately. Next up, for the first time of the night, a wild slap nuts appears. Slap nuts gets a mic and says he's going to keep the talking short because the name of the show is Total Non-Stop Action Wrestling. He's talking about a World Heavyweight Number One Contendership Tournament. Slap nuts then puts a bounty on Mr. Wrestling Free's head. Suddenly you can hear a voice interrupting. It cuts to the ramp and Kurt Henning is there looking confused. I think he went too soon. He calls Jeff Jarrett dumb and talks about things that happened in WCW five years earlier. Henning then accuses Jarrett of being Mr. Wrestling Free and says tonight he's going to find him and kick his ass. What do you mean you're going to find him? He's right there. Go do it. A bad promo. Triple threat for the NWA tag team titles now. The Hot Shots are one of the contenders, but they don't squeeze their junk. How are these guys in a title match? I thought they were told they were the bottom rated team, and they're taking on Chris and Rick Michaels who are extremely boring. The champions are Storm and Harris, and a big brawl breaks out on the ramp before Storm could even use his cap guns. The mats get ripped away on the outside and Storm gets slammed onto the exposed floor. In the ring, the Michaels brothers and the Hot Shots are working together. They look like rejects from the Blonde Just For Men adverts. Storm gets slammed again on the ring mats, but this time not on the exposed floor for some reason. Cassidy O'Reilly hits a leg drop from the ring apron on Storm. They all finally get back in the ring and Storm hits a big kick. This turns the match around and Harris comes in and beats everyone up on his own. The team that will soon be known as America's Most Wanted work together and Harris hits a bulldog. Michaels hits a DDT on Storm, but the Hot Shots break up the pin, and now finally every team starts fighting. The Hot Shots hit a funny rolling manoeuvre to take out one of the Michaels boys, quite like that one. Then Cassidy O'Reilly hits a nice frog splash, he got some serious hang time for another two count. To be fair to Cassidy O'Reilly, he's been fairly impressive in the ring. It's just a shame that he looks so damn depressed. The Michaels boys hit an elbow off the top on Harris, but this match is still not over. Storm and Harris then hit the death sentence on the Michaels boy, and it's over. Then the lights go out, and when they come back on, the disciples of the new church are here with James Mitchell. We haven't seen these guys for a while. 
Brian Lee is now in the new church instead of Malice. Brian Lee chokeslams Storm off the ramp, but the camera angle is terrible. He shouldn't have even bothered doing it. Lee then stacks Harris on a table and Slash dives off the balcony to put Harris through the table. It was impressive, but Brian Lee has been a complete jobber so far. This has done nothing to change my opinion. I don't think he's won a single matchup. Then they leave and the lights go out and then they come back on and the cage dancers just start happily dancing like nothing ever happened. Oh, next up, Mike Tanay is interviewing the half man, half mold Bullet Bob. He says he's got some new rules for title matches. If someone gets DQ'd or counted out, the belt will change hands. He also makes the Nazi boy the special referee for all tournament matches tonight. I don't know why this is even a thing. Did anyone get DQ'd or counted out deliberately before? Correct me if I'm wrong about that. And why does it have to be the Nazi boy? No one wants to see him as a referee. Talking about Nazis, his identical twin is in the following match. He actually won his first match in the last video, but he's still a complete jobber. He'll be taking on BG James in this tournament match. I honestly don't think I've ever seen a match that I cared less about. I'd rather watch Miss TNA Bruce versus David Young. I mean that. During the match, they say that Six Pack is injured and he'll not be facing Brian Lawler tonight. That is a massive letdown. It was the only thing I was looking forward to. This match is boring. It cuts to the back to show Jarrett beating on a bloody Kurt Hennig. Back at the ring, James hits a knee drop and the twin Nazi counts a fair looking two count. BJ James then starts complaining for no reason and then when he turns around, he gets floored. James shoves the referee and then the Nazi referee pulls him away and then his brother boots James. The half man, half mold then comes out and fires the Nazi referee. Then they have an argument. The Nazi actually makes a fair point and says that it's only because Brian James is his son. That was a good point. And then he smacks Bullet Bob. Okay, the Nazi has started to grow on me. Never thought I'd say that. Back in the ring, James wins the match with a roll up. So I guess the Nazi's winning streak is over at one. Next up is something weird. It's Jorge Estrada and Priscilla who has a kick-ass body and a kick to the head face. You can see their opponents just randomly waiting on the ramp. It's the albino Harry Potter and the crackhead Ace Steel. He says he's recruited a new person to the group for tonight. 90% of you watching right now are straight, but there's 10% of you watching who might not be. And that's okay, because you're all together listening to the Hawk talk. It's Miss TNA, Bruce. There's two strange crowd members who are dressed as Bluce and Plumtree. What, did they lose a bet or something? Bruce is chasing Priscilla around the outside of the ring, and out of nowhere, Jorge dives on top of him. Back in the ring, Ace Still and Bruce hit a dropkick powerbomb combination for a two count. Bruce stamps on Estrada on the floor as the crowd frantically chant TNA. Estrada quickly fights back with a crossbody, but Bruce rolls through as the crowd chant, You're a sissy. Ace Steel hits a nice suplex on Estrada, and then he works with Bruce to make the Elvis flying. Steel misses a diving headbutt, but I didn't think he had any brain cells left in there to lose, and Jorge's about to make the tag, but his partner gets knocked off the ring apron. I can't believe she's supposed to be the hot tag. Jorge nails a double crossbody and gets a two count. Priscilla then trips up Ace Steel, and this allows Jorge to hit the trip to Graceland and the moonsault for a two. Talking of trips to Graceland, make sure you subscribe now and join us as we fly to the Graceland of 100k subscribers. This is a much more serious wrestling match than I expected. Estrada looks for a moonsault, but Bruce knocks him from the top. Ace Steel then hits his gory special type finisher, and he manages to nail it a bit better than last time. In the ring, Bruce rolls him up, and we're done. Priscilla didn't even get in the ring in the end. Jorge did well though, I actually liked the guy. For no reason at all, the albino Harry Potter grabs Priscilla and they proceed to spank her and stamp on her. This is another team of blonde just for men rejects right here. If this faction continues much longer, that's what I'm calling them. Randomly, a song starts playing out loud. We are the champions. It's Kurt Hennig. He's stumbling out to the ring looking like mold. He couldn't look any further from a champion right here. Jarrett then attacks him with a steel chair on his way to the ring. Why doesn't the half man half mold do something about this one? The management booking is so inconsistent. Jarrett gets him in the ring and hits the stroke, and the referee counts three. I didn't even know it was a match. Was that really a tournament match? Does that really count? I legit didn't realise this was a match. Jarrett is a bad winner, and he hits Kurt Henning with a steel chair. I guess he's upset too that Brian Lawler vs Six Pack isn't happening. In the back, Goldilocks is interviewing Jerry Lynn about his tournament match tonight. It's been an hour, I've not even seen the tournament brackets. King of the ring, this is not. He's taken on Sonny, don't look at my ass Yaki, the man who injured his knee and caused him to get stripped of the title. Goldilocks is in the corridor with don't look at my ass, who's standing uncomfortably close to her. He says his name eight times and not a lot else. Sonny's out next for the match and he looks like he's been rolling in a bathtub of baby oil. Jerry Lynn isn't hanging around as he comes to the ring and hits the first big move of the matchup to hit a head scissors. Lynn also hits a jumping bulldog from the top for a two count. 
The crowd chant Rocky Rip off at Siaki as he storms off to look at the crowd. Siaki is distracted and Lin hits a somersault dive off the ring apron onto him. Jerry Lin's leg seems to be fine, which begs the question, why did he get stripped of the X Division title? Back in the ring, Sonny Siaki drops Lin across the ropes. Lin almost wins her a roll up before Siaki hits a bat breaker, followed by a reverse DDT. Siaki continues doing well with a running net breaker as the crowd start the rock chants again. Siaki starts to get frustrated that he can't get the win. He heads to the top, then Lin cuts him off and he nails a superplex. Jerry Lin starts his comeback and plants Siaki with a DDT, but somehow it's only a two count. Lin fixes his one again as he nails a TKO for another two count. Siaki fights off the cradle par driver attempt and hits a Samoan net breaker. Then there's a ref bump. It took almost the whole first episode for me to say that, this must be a record. Siaki grabs a chair and he swings for Lin but misses and then Lin boots him in the face. It's not over though because the referee is out. Lin's looking for the nail in the coffin but Siaki wakes up and DDT's Lin on the chair. Lin then somehow kicks out, oh come on. Then Siaki hits a drop toe hold and Siaki rolls him up with his feet on the ropes. Game over. Big win for Siaki. Lots of wrestling on this show, it's great stuff here. Lin attacks Siaki because he's a bad loser. Outside somewhere, Brian Lawler is smiling and cuddling his girlfriend. I guess he forgot about her kissing Pac last week. He says that he's a piece of trash and isn't threatened by him. He's kissing her neck while she looks bored. It reminds me of V and Fuso and his girlfriend. Confusingly, he's out again next for another talking segment. He gets into an argument with some four-eyed geek and then he pulls the fan over the safety rail and beats him up. I'm pretty sure this guy deserved it. He wouldn't have tried that with the chair boy, it would have been a much more even fight. Lawler has a mic and he's completely losing it again. He challenges the crowd members to a fight and then he leaves. What was the point? X Division title on the line for the main event. The challenger is the amazing red who will be taking on the champion AJ Styles with the albino Harry Potter as his manager. This one should be good. They start off with arm drags until AJ says no more of that and boots him square in his headband. They start trading pinfalls and a breathless start to the match. Then red boots Styles square in his goofy head. Stars hits a German, but Red lands on his feet. AJ then tries a springboard, but Red drop kicks him to the outside. Red then dives down on top of him. Don West is practically reaching the point of climax here. AJ then finally does something as he hits what I call the Samoan net breaker, shade to Sonny Siaki. AJ then floors him to completely turn the match. Stars gets a two count next of a brain buster, but AJ doesn't try very hard to cover him. AJ then tries for another brain buster, but this time Red reverses it with a code red for a two count. AJ tries another move this time and Red turns it around and spikes AJ with a DDT. It's very back and forth here as Red fights off a Styles Clash attempt but AJ smashes him with a powerbomb instead. After a bit of a breather, Red quickens the pace and gets a two count on a standing star press. The crowd come completely unhinged as Red reverses a powerbomb and Red gets another two. Then the albino Harry Potter decides to try and ruin the match and gets involved, and this allows AJ Styles to clothesline Red. But it's not over yet though as Red catches Styles at the top. It looks like AJ's going to hit a Styles Clash. Then it looks like a powerbomb attempt, but instead Red hits a Hurricanrana. But AJ rolls through, and the match is over. What a great ending that was, probably one of the best matches in TNA up to this point. So that's show one down, really good wrestling action, not really anything crazy, silly or stupid. I think that could change soon though. Show 2 starts out with uh, the Rainbow Express. Wait a minute, Lenny Lane's just randomly back after about 10 shows. What the hell happened to him? Bruce is arguing with Goldilocks about shoes. Bruce says that the only reason Lenny left TNA is because Lenny got jealous of Bruce being Miss TNA. How could anyone possibly care about this? Jorge Estrada is out next with Priscilla. I'm all for this guy getting a push and Priscilla looks like she's been pushed in the face. The Rainbow Express are out now. Bruce will be fighting Estrada with the Miss TNA crown on the line. I can't believe how much TV time Bruce has gotten. This is like episode 20 of TNA and he's on almost every single show. Estrada's doing well against Bruce as he hits him with suplexes. Priscilla randomly decides to distract the referee. This allows Bruce to hit a powerbomb with Lenny Lane double teaming with a dropkick. What an idiot she is. How does Estrada kick out of this though? All these questions but the real question is why am I even bothering? Estrada nearly beats both Lenny and Bruce at the same time. It's basically a handicap match just like the last one. Estrada's great again and he counters a powerbomb on the outside of the ring. I don't know why they don't just give Estrada a quick win, it'll make him look better. Estrada then hits a bulldog, Trish Stratus style, but the match continues. Estrada then hits a slam and screams that he's going to Graceland, and I hope you all are too. Unfortunately, Jorge misses the moonsault because Bruce gets his knees up. The crowd are now chanting for Bruce, and not in a jokey way. Priscilla gets in the ring and starts kissing Bruce. The Rainbow Express seem a bit upset about this move, and then Estrada crashes down on top of them. 
This match has now been running for 15 minutes. Everybody starts charging around the outside of the ring. Bruce slips on a banana peel like something out of a cartoon. Miss TNA Bruce is knocked out and he gets counted out of the match. Jorge Estrada is declared the winner. He then goes to take the Miss TNA sash, but then they announce that TNA titles cannot change hands on a count out. So is this the whole reason the half man half mole changed the rules, just so that Bruce could continue to be Miss TNA? Well how could you blame me for thinking that? Nothing else has happened to do with it. Lenny Lane looks like Chris Jericho's half sister. Goldilocks is in the back with Siaki, saying his name and speaking like he's on drugs. Sonny Siaki is the hottest commodity in wrestling today. Sonny Siaki, young, sexy, good looking. Sonny Siaki is the past, present and future of TNA. Sonny Siaki, the best athlete this business has to offer, is destined to become NWA champion. After I beat BG James, yeah. I'll let you feel my love. Oh, God. He threatens BG James and hits on Goldilocks as usual. Only said he'd name four times here. We finally get to see a tournament bracket next after only three matches. Don't look at my asses out now for his second round match and he'll be taking on Mold Dog. He has a microphone and he tells Sonny Siaki that he's about as good looking as his ass. Road Dog has a visor on back to front and upside down. Don't try this style today's kids, you'll get beaten up. Road Dog almost rolls Siaki up and this embarrasses young Siaki who drop kicks him down with rage. Then randomly Siaki puts a variation of an Indian death lock on but it doesn't lead to anything. James isn't as much of a good opponent as Jerry Lynn last week but speak of the devil he comes out to watch the match. Then BG James puts Sonny Siaki away of a pump handle. Pretty much a clean win for Mold Dog, so what was the point of Lin coming out? Yeah, he came out and looked at Siaki about 5 minutes before the end of the match. He did nothing wrong, he just walked and looked. It's 2002 and we're still pushing Mold Dog. Come on TNA, get a grip. For some reason, Chris Harris is in the back screaming and swearing at Goldilocks. Oh yeah, they got jumped by the new church, I completely forgot about that already. Storm then takes the mic and cuts a very good promo, and we even get his first ever sorry about your damn luck. Well, let me tell you something. I am the biggest, the baddest, fuck, son of a bitch on the face of this earth. I am not one of them men who crawls in a hole waiting to turn to ashes. I will wait until I'm able to kick your ass and slash and leave to stay you from hell. You ain't seen hell yet, but it's coming tonight. Sorry about your damn luck, boys. James Mitchell is leading his disciples Slash and Brian Lee out next, and they'll be taking on Harris and Storm. This one should be good as the AMW boys are all fired up. Storm and Harris hit a nice clothesline super kick combination. Harris then crashes on top of Slash who's busted open. Then AMW hit the death sentence. Is this about to be over after only 30 seconds? No, apparently not. Slash is already up somehow. The church then hit a nice double team in the ring on Storm. Then the new church hit their own version of the death sentence as they hit an elbow drop into a side slam. Storm does eventually tag Harris in and he makes short work of the church. He has the match won with the catatonic on Brian Lee, but the referee is distracted. Slash then nails Harris with the chair and then Lee makes the pin, but Harris kicks out at two. This is another really good match. It's definitely the best tag team match in TNA so far. Then it gets ruined as Brian Lee starts hitting Storm and Harris with a spike. What an idiot, they were probably going to win the match. At least it furthers the feud and makes you want to see more of them. Next up we get the match that we've all been waiting for. It's Brian Lawler of his girlfriend April versus Six Pack. Lawler aggressively dominates Pack in the early gun. He screams at April to slap Pack, but she just won't do it. He's completely distracted and goes to the outside to question her as to why she wouldn't do it. Pack hits a beautiful kick to knock Brian Lawler off the ring apron. Lawler then fights back by sending Pack into the ring pole, nutsack first. The crowd start chanting at April that she's got herpes. Lawler misses the hip hop drop into the ring. This gives Pack a window and he boots Lawler and then he power bombs him. Pat points April and he hits the Bronco Buster on Lawler. Then he goes outside and starts kissing her. Lawler follows him to the outside and he gives a super kick to him. Lawler's going even more crazy than normal and he calls her a see you next Tuesday. Pack suddenly wins the match with the X Factor. Pack celebrates with April and then he leaves with her. What I don't get about this whole thing is why she seems to be happy with Lawler one minute and then hates him the next. And she's making accusations against Pack and then she wants to be with him. And same for Pack, why would he want to be with her when she accused him of rape last week? Lawler grits his teeth and he starts to dump in his nappy of anger. Then he grabs his heart. Oh, this is distasteful. He's faking a heart attack. And in a complete comedic value, by the way. April runs out to see if he's okay. And now she's cradling and kissing him. Oh, this whole thing is so confusing. 
I can't believe he faked a heart attack in such a goofy way. I love this and I hate this at the same time. Lawler was freaking nuts. Mike Tanay interviews the truth next and Killing says that Tanay is the only person he trusts. Wow, his life must be pretty bad. He gives Mike Tanay a contract for a title match against Mr. Wrestling 3 to face him. Slapnuts is out next to be interviewed by Mike Tanay. He gets accused of being Mr. Wrestling 3. Tanay tells Jarrett to sign the contract for the match with Truth. Like an idiot, Jarrett rips up the contract and says that he's not Mr. Wrestling 3. He says that he's waited for 20 shows for a world title shot and no one's going to sneak in before him. If he's so desperate for a world title match, why doesn't he just pretend that he's Mr. Wrestling 3 even if he's not? It'll get him a world title shot. What an idiot. He can't have wanted a world title shot that badly, could he? Time for the weekly cage dance roundup. One looks like a bowl of gone off salad and the other seems to be pretty popular because she's here every week. Now we have a five-way table elimination match. This is a good one, folks. It's Kid Cash, the SATs. You know, there's something seriously wrong with these SAT guys. They have zero personality. Are they twins? Also in the match is Tony Mamaluke. The match starts and then suddenly they realise that there's meant to be a fifth man in here and Ace Steel is supposed to be there. He rushes out and joins them. One of the SATs hits a big moonsault to the outside. Tony Mamaluke also hits a crossbody onto them. Kid Cash, damn. Kid Cash has some serious hops. I love his double springboard dives. NWA Impact brings you the smack of the week. Sponsored by all new Blonde for Men. If you're a brown haired potter, put some blonde in it. It makes you look hotter. My name's Kid Cash, man. This guy looks like a burn packet of Walker's Crisp in the back of your mum's cupboard. He's shoveling his signals going for a dive. He's gonna fly on these grease balls. They've all got black hair. Here comes Kid Cash, double spring, flip flip, wham! These grease ball black haired dudes are all down. That was the NWA TNA Smack of the Week, sponsored by Blonde Just For Men. Get it? Got it? Shove it. Cash springs back into the ring again to take out Ace Steel. Steel isn't that hurt though and he drops Cash across his knee. One of the SATs tries to dive into the ring but he misses and Mamaluke puts an armbar on him for no reason at all. Cash then hits a springboard hurricanrana and then he tries another but the SAT catches him and power bombs him on the outside. I almost forgot this was a tables match but Ace still brings one in finally. Tony Mumluke climbs on top of the table that's stacked in the corner. He's got Ace still up there. They try his suplex and they both crash into the middle of the ring, but no tables are broken. Then Ace still gets eliminated as he's thrown through the table with a DDT. Mumluke splashes out at the ring and clears the table and fuds into the ground with it, but it looked quite impressive. The next man eliminated is that very man, Tony Mumluke, as an SAT puts him through the table on the outside of a moonsault. The SATs now have a big time advantage, two on one against Kid Cash. Kid Cash hits a nice suplex into his knee. Love that move and everything he's done so far to be fair. Cash then hits that move again, in case you missed it the first time. The SATs try a double powerbomb but Cash turns it around with a double hurricanrana. For some reason Don West compares it to famous women's tennis players Venus and Serena Williams. Yeah they certainly had a nice double something. Cash is really holding his own against the two brothers and he sends them to the outside of the ring. Cash starts throwing chairs around because he's sick of the SATs, I don't blame him. He sets one of them up on a table and then he fights the other on top of the turnbuckle and then he snaps off a hurricanrana to send one through the table on top of the other. Kid Cash wins the match. This was an excellent X Division spot match. This might have even been one of the most enjoyable matches in TNA history up to this point. It was actually better than Amazing Red vs Styles. Find and watch this one. Oh, Kid Cash is now the number one contender for the X Division title. Slapnuts is out next to make fun of Kurt Hennig's resume in wrestling and he compares how much more successful he's been in terms of title wins. Jarrett says that Hennig's scared to fight him and tells the referee to ring the bell and award the match to him. Wait, so they're doing this match again? Hennig suddenly jumps him in street clothes. Kurt Hennig smacks the referee one. I don't think this is even a match, or if it is, it's been thrown out now. Hennig beats Jarrett for ages and he gets Jarrett in the ring. He hits the Hennig plex, not once, not twice, but thrice, and it sure wasn't nice. Just the main event now, which will be Jerry Lynn challenging for his X Division title that he never lost against the champion AJ Styles. These two have been feuding from day dot in TNA. AJ scores the first knockdown and he seems pretty happy about this. The winner of this match will take on Kid Cash on the next show which will be a great match whoever wins. There's a pretty long feeling out process here and no one really has a clear advantage. AJ thinks he's got Lin's number again and he celebrates a bit too early as he gets clotheslined out. Lin carries on winning with the most beautiful backbreaker I think I've ever seen. Tane asks for a replay <laughs> and then he says oh we can't give you one I'm afraid. There's a red bar at the bottom of the screen, it's trying to load. I think it was lagging. Then the same thing happens again, but this time Lin drops Styles across the ropes for a two count. AJ's really struggling in this match as Lin hits a springboard dropkick to send Styles to the outside. There's a really nice exchange as Styles tries to get back in the ring, but Lin ends up sweeping his legs out and keeping him on the outside. 
They're fighting on the outside and Styles leaps over the crowd barrier effortlessly and then he gives Lin the super kick. Styles is now in the crowd as our lovely audience help him to his feet. Styles tries a springboard off the guardrail but Lin takes him out in mid-air. The albino Harry Potter realises his guy's in trouble and gets involved and he stomps on Jerry Lin. This allows Styles to wake up and dives on top of Lin from the ring. It doesn't seem to help him too much though because in the ring, Lin no sells a bat body drop so Styles makes sure he stays down this time. Styles has a chance to hit the Styles Clash but instead he puts on a Boston Crab. Styles can't make him tap and then he just randomly stops trying. I hate it when wrestlers do this. Why would he release the hold? He had no reason to. Potter distracts the referee and AJ hits a kick to the nutsack and an inverted DDT but he only gets a two count. For some reason AJ does that pointless moonsault kick in the corner and then Lin makes him pay for it. Jerry Lin finally turns it around for Powerbomb as AJ screams swear words as he's going through the air. He looks like a kid on a fairground ride. Styles tries to attempt the DDT but Lin reverses it and suplexes him into the corner. Jerry Lin then takes out Potter by slamming AJ's meathead into his and then he hits a cradle pile driver but it's only a two. Don't look at my ass then suddenly appears on the ramp. Lin has to match one but don't look pulls the referee out of the ring. Lin seems to have the deck stacked against him in this one doesn't he? Potter shoves a chair between the ropes and AJ smashes Lin face first into the chair but Lin kicks out of the pin again. Then straight after AJ hits the Styles Clash but Lin kicks out again. This is insane, how's he doing this? Styles heads to the top and then Lin catches him up there and he nails a big time superplex. Lin and Styles keep reversing each other's moves and then it ends with Jerry Lin hitting a tombstone power driver and it's over. What a back and forth match. And then the show just goes off the air straight away, they had no time for anything else. What a wrestling heavy show. It feels like a different person writes the show each week. The silly stuff seems to be over for good and if you don't agree with that I'll slam you through your car hood.